Yeah, so I'll just dive right into it. But I did feel, it's a few weeks ago, early, Octo or early August, I was praying about the fall and uh, some of the things that uh, I was feeling that God was saying to us as a church and particularly our team and where we were going. And I kept having this prompting, I, we need to gather our, our, our volunteers, we need to gather our team, Team Victory, and just talk about this a little bit. And I mentioned it in a staff meeting. Um, we have a staff meeting every week. We gather our, our staff team together. And as soon as I mentioned it, just all the way around the table, it was like, yes, 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 let's do that. So we booked a date and then uh, started getting the word out. And I know it was a bit uh, last minute and yet uh, you're here. So again, just thank you, thank you uh, for showing up. So we're in a new season. Uh, we're heading into a new season. And I believe that this uh, time in the church in North America is a really, really critical time. Um, the, our world is getting, our North American world is getting increasingly secular at a fast pace right now. And you feel that? It's been happening for like 50 plus years, so it's nothing new, but uh, it's really moving quickly. And so what we're going to see, and we've already seen, but we're going to see increasingly um, just a total obliviousness, right? Just a, a, about God and Jesus and the church and the gospel and so on. It's just like it's non-existent. A um, lot of people in Moose Jaw don't know where Victory Church is, okay? Even though we're on Main Street, even though we have a massive building and all of those things, not because they don't like Victory Church, but because they don't care. Does that make sense? They could drive by it and read the sign 50 times and be like, huh, has nothing to do with anything I know anything about, care about anything, and it pops right out of their head. Just like half the places in Moose Jaw that you don't know exist, even if you've lived here your whole life, because there are things that aren't part of your world, right? So anyway, this is increasingly being, being a reality. And in North America, around the world, Christianity is growing really cool. God's doing cool things around the world. North America is a tougher uh, case right now uh, in, in church history. And, uh, but in North America, Christianity as a whole is shrinking. Um, but when you look at the, the numbers more uh, specifically, here's what you'll find. Um, nominal inherited Christianity is shrinking at a fast rate. So nominal, meaning sort of uh, Christianity where you just go to church and it doesn't really mean a lot to the rest of your life. And inherited meaning, well, my parents are that, so I guess I'm that too, right? Just, uh, you know, I was born a Canadian, so I guess I'm a Christian. That kind of Christianity. I call it cultural Christianity. On the flip side, there's a bright light in North America that is super cool, especially over the last probably 15, 20 years. Um, there, the church has exploded in size in a specific group, what we would call the evangelical slash Pentecostal type churches are just, uh, uh, reaching people like, uh, I don't know, maybe never before. I'm not sure, but I know that that segment of Christianity is growing significantly and our church gets to be a part of that, which is cool. Um, but, uh, here's the deal for us, I think as a church is that for us to, uh, just be real clear about as this uh, split continues to happen, society gets more and more secular, um, that we as a church continue to go, okay, what does that mean for us in reaching across this bridge that nobody's reaching the other way, right? And how are we going to do that when they don't even know we exist or care we exist and and so on? So anyway, that that's going to become the increasing... Uh, reality, it already is our reality, but increasingly so. And um, for our church in particular, um, we've hit uh, the, the 500 plus mark of people, which is super cool. It's a, a neat church to be a part of that way and exciting to see the, the, all that growth, especially for a town this size. Um, but one thing that that means, and I, I think I've shared this before in a context like this, but one thing that means for us is really in Moose Jaw, um, uh, historically, no church has ever broken that 500 mark or so. And so whenever you hit up, up against a, pla a barrier like that, you have to say, okay, to, to get results that no one's ever got before, you got to do things no one's ever done before, right? And so, you know, we just have to think together and pray together and strategize together. What does that mean for us uh, moving into the future as far as going to the next uh, levels that, that God wants for us? Now, one thing that I want to be real clear on, and I'll say this as boldly as I can and yet as graciously as I can, not every church actually wants to grow, okay? Just being real honest with you. So you have to decide that. And any church that actually is growing has what we would call a growth mindset. Probably 
not maybe not any, but 80% of churches that are actually growing. That's what we call a growth mindset. In other words, the people of the church, the leaders of the church are determined that one way or another, we're going to find a way to see this thing continue to grow. And um, you say, well, why does that have to be? Why do you need a growth mindset? Well, because growth is messy and growth changes things. So if right now we're 500 plus people. If we grew to 700 plus people, those of you who are part of our, our team right now, you'd say, it's just different around here. It's just different, right? And it, it's, it's uncomfortable different. Um, so like, I'll give you an example. One of the major things that changes at every level of growth is the relationship of the lead pastor to the people, right? So that, that's just different. You're like, ah, oh, it's just different. Um, another one is um, there's an added layer of complexity. So our church used to be simpler. It was just easier. It was easier to just show up and you could just, you know, now it's more complicated and there's more, you know, layers of stuff. And um, another one is that sometimes uh, uh, positions shift around. And so somebody who's doing something for years and years and years is no longer doing that. It's like, ah, how does that work? And so anyway, that, that's, those are some of the uncomfortables. Of course, um, we're committed to that. So you got to sort of remind yourself as you pay the price of growth of the positive things. So um, one of the reminders that I remind myself when I'm paying the price of growth is it's better than the alternative, right? <laughs> so the alternative is not staying the same, okay? The alternative is stagnating, okay? So that is just a good reminder to ourselves, even personal growth, right? You're like, wow, personal growth is hard and oh, oh, oh. but hey, it's better than the alternative, right? So that's one reminder. Um, a another reminder for me when it comes to church world is God has called us to reach more people. I mean, that's just, we have a mandate from heaven. The kingdom of God is expanding. That's what the kingdom was made to do. And uh, we're a part of that. And, and we don't have sort of, a, 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 you know, the option to choose that. And all through the book of Acts, um, you'll see this. They, they are concerned about not just the ministries of the church, but also the growth of the church. And it's named clearly time and time and time again through the book of Acts. That's a concern uh, for them. And it's part of the mandate of the kingdom. Um, and uh, if there's still one person left to reach, then we're not done, right? We got to continue on uh, doing that. So, and another advantage, of course, is the, the larger church gets, if we do it wisely and well, um, the more we have to offer those we reach and the more effective we can become uh, at reaching people. So anyway, at the end of the day, it's not an option for us. And uh, we are part of a group of churches called Victory. Uh, one thing you'll get to know if you hang out in Victory churches at all is in the DNA of Victory is that maintenance is not an option, right? It's just not. It's, uh, um, we're, a, we're committed to, I'm forgetting the little statement. There's a little statement of victory that basically says, yeah, but we're committed to increase as opposed to maintenance. I think that's the way it's phrased. Um, but that is part of our DNA, and it's, it's part of who we are as a church and who uh, we'll continue to be. Now, that doesn't mean we're always going to be growing and it's always going to be in a growth season. There's different seasons for churches and you go through seasons where numerical growth is happening. And then you go through other seasons where other kinds of growth are happening and that's fine. I've pastored for 24 years. At least half of those, I have not seen numerical growth in the churches I've been in. So, you know, it's not like uh, everything is just a steep up and to the right curve. There's plateaus, there's seasons where you work on other things. Um, I was teaching a workshop on church growth a while back, and I asked uh, my son, um, you know, what's happened at Moose Jaw that we've done that's helped us grow as a church? And he said, well, Dad, I think what we do is we grow, and then we stop and we repair. <laughs> and then we grow again, and then we repair. And then we grow and repair. And I thought, that's a good answer. Um, that has been a, a pattern for us. And so it's not like you just... Uh, and, and, of course, even talking about growth, it makes people nervous because, you know, is it about man and is it this and that? Uh, listen, it's about the glory of God. It's about the kingdom of God. That's what we're here for. When our motives are wrong, because we're mixed bags of motives, we don't change our right behaviors. We change our wrong motives. Does that make sense? If you're doing the right thing for the wrong reason, don't stop doing the right thing. <laughs> right? Sometimes it scares people. They're like, yeah, but I see people doing that and they have all the wrong motives in doing it. And so then they avoid doing it. Well, if it's the right thing to do, just because people are doing it with the wrong reasons, don't not do it. Just change your motives. Are you all with me on this? Yeah, sometimes in church ministry, this happens, actually. People will come, they'll say, I've been serving in this ministry for, you know, five years, but then I realized my heart was for the wrong reason. I realized that I was doing it for my own applause or, you know, to look good or this or that. And, and so I'm going to step down. <laughs> you know, my answer always is back. Don't step down. Change your heart. Right? And keep going. That's awesome that you realize that. 
mean, we all have seasons where we realize our motives aren't in, the, in exactly the right space. Anyway, so so that just I think those things are worth saying. And of course, when we talk about growth, we're not just talking about numbers. We we want to be healthy as we grow, and not all growth is healthy growth. And so we acknowledge that, and we say, let's make sure that we do it in in wise ways and so on. But here's a great verse uh, that we use as a vision verse for our church. Uh, Paul saying, all this is for your benefit, talking to the Corinthians. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, you get that? More and more. Uh, In the kingdom of God until Jesus comes back, that's our vision. We want to reach more. And why? Well, there'll be great thanksgiving and God receives more and more glory. He is glorified when we we bear much fruit. Uh, Then Ephesians 4.16 is another great verse that includes the health piece to it. So that the whole body is a great, actually a whole passage on on what the church is about and a vision for the church um, about everyone serving together, everyone ministering one to another and so on. But just so the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So um, uh, just uh, two quick vision stories for you just to help you see what we're all about. So I think uh, two or three weeks ago. I was standing just at these doors here, was visiting with a couple in our church and uh, just asking them about some of the things going on in their world. Some of the things were pretty tough that they were facing and we're chatting about those. And then uh, they just lit up, smiles came on their faces and they said, but we sat beside a new person today and we just brought them to the guest center and I got their name and I'm going to follow up with them this week. Man, I could have fallen over and died right there as a pastor and I'd just go to heaven happy. Right? I'm just like, that's church. That's it. You know, and I, I looked at them. I'm like, that's so cool. That's that's what we're all about. And they were like, well, it's a great church. Why wouldn't we be like that? You know, yes. <laughs> Thank you, God. You know, so I've been living off that for the last uh, two weeks. I'm just <laughs> so excited. And literally, I mean, I came to Monday staff meeting and I we, we do celebrations and improvements, and that was my big celebration. I'm just like, this is it. I mean, I just love it. So let me give you one more. Um, I got this email last week, and this is a couple, uh, new in our church, just been coming for a few weeks, and uh, they have been invited by at least a dozen people in our church, okay? Been invited. And uh, actually, about a month or two ago, I was in the foyer, and there was a guy in our foyer uh, a gentleman in our church with the biggest smile on his face. It's the first time I've ever seen him with a big smile on his face, honestly. And he's standing there. I'm like, hey, how are you today? You know, I go up and greet him. And he says, I'm good. I'm on, what do you call it? The fool's bench. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, the fool's bench. That's what we call when we invite our friends to church and we're hoping they're going to come, right? And we don't know for sure. And we're just, right? And he said, I, I, I'm i pretty sure this couple's going to come. They, you know, they're the whatever, this this couple, and, and he says, I, I think they'll be here today. It'll be their first time. And I was like, that is so cool. And then I start. then they did come. So I'm, you know, I'm like, that's cool. I saw them here. That's so cool. And then I had like uh, like four or five other couples. Did you see that couple's here? I invited them. I'm like, what? These guys are getting like, not just double teamed, like quadruple teamed, right? They're here. So I got this email from them last week. I went up just the, the Sunday before last and walked up to them and introduced myself. It's the first time I met them. And here's what he says. Pastor Dan, I, I edited it down a little bit so you just hear the highlights of this email. But We were glad to have you come and shake our hands last Sunday. A few weeks ago, Dustin Bennett spoke. It touched me personally. I felt God in my very presence then. That young man is a special person who has seen into my soul, my thoughts, and helped me turn. I'm so filled with faith and confidence in God's work in my life this past few months that I can't even express my gratitude. This is a serious season of spring and planting for me. I'm so glad to have found you, your wife, and Victory Church. Looking forward to a relationship where my wife and I can become followers of Jesus and tell others about the good news. God bless. I was cutting and pasting that into my notes this afternoon and I'm just like crying in my living room. I mean, I just go, that's it, right? That's, that's what we're here for. So, um, this Sunday, uh, uh, I could tell these stories all day long and they just fire me up and want to fire you up. So anyway, this Sunday, a gal in our church, uh, invited her mom. Right. And she emailed me and said, you know, please pray invite it. And then she's here. And then we were celebrating that. and, And, uh, just saw her in the foyer after this. I'm like, your mom came. And she's like, I know, this is so cool. So anyway, wow. Okay, so uh, as we uh, continue on with this mission, 
Uh, I want to give you some uh, three things that I think will help us together um, accomplish the, the mission that we have in the coming year. And here's what my prayer is, that, that in this coming season, we can kind of break through to another level as a church, um, whether that means numerically, certainly hope and pray that does, but also just in our effectiveness in ministry, reaching people, and so on. And um, to, to talk about that, I want to actually uh, just play a little video that I made last week. And this is a video that's going to end up online for you guys and, and for us, but <laughs> you'll see. It's kind of funny. But anyway, it's a little video we're going to play. We'll pop it on the screen here, I think. Can we pull that off? All right. Hey there, we are going to start making a whole series of videos that are for orienting, equipping, and training uh, all of those who are part of Team Victory. If you're part of uh, the, the team that helps make Victory Church in Moose Jaw happen, then these videos are for you. And I'm really, really excited about them. Um, some of them will be more devotional in nature. We'll just talk about your own walk with God because that's the critical piece that's the foundation for everything else. And then uh, many of them are going to be just practical, orienting you around who our church is, uh, what some of the things you need to know about serving in our church and being a part of the team of our church and that kind of thing. And then some of them will be more leadership oriented and uh, helping you just be the influencer that God's called you to be. So I'm super excited about doing these. And this is the very first one. And here's what I want you to know for the very first of Pastor Dan's leadership and equipping and uh, orienting of, of our team. And this is what you need to know. You matter. You matter way more than you probably realize that you do. Um, it, no matter what it is that you do as part of our team, every single team member in our church matters so, so much. And I, I, I just think there's a, the, the devil tries to lie to us. There's this lie that we hear, uh, whether it's the devil or just our own insecurities or whatever. But so often we think, eh, what I do is no big deal or what I do doesn't really matter. Or, I'm just doing this. And the years people sometimes say, you know, what is it you do? Well, I just do whatever, you know. But listen to me. Whether you uh, greet people with love or care for somebody or say prayers, how many of you know prayers matter? Uh, Maybe you uh, help people park. Maybe you uh, take care of somebody's child in our children's ministry or in the nursery. I mean, those are huge, huge things. Those matter. How many of you know for, to the parents that matters? <laughs> um, everything anybody on our team does matters so much. And here's what you need to know. What you're doing, if you're part of Team Victory, then what you do as part of our team, you're not just like doing some little job. You're a kingdom builder. You're a soul winner. You're a part of leading people to know, love, and serve Jesus. You're a part of people's eternal destinies being changed. And, and you, you can't compare one part against another. Actually, 1 Corinthians 12, it's a whole chapter about this in the Bible, where Paul just tells the Corinthian church, every part, each one of you is a part of the body of Christ, and each of you have gifts, and each of you matter, whether you're giving somebody an encouraging word, or whether you're looking somebody in the eye and just listening to them and caring for them, or whether you're serving as a guitar player or a singer, or, you know, it, it, it's not an issue of what it is, the, the particular thing you're doing. It's that all those things matter so much. And they matter because we're, we're a team getting something done together. And so every part is so critical. And, and this is what happens. If you know how much you matter, Okay, then you'll treat what you do differently. Uh, you come more prepared. You come more with a, 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 a vision, an excitement, a heart to do what it is that, that, that you're doing. You come uh, with energy, right? You come energized going, oh, I better bring my best. It's not that you have to be perfect. It's, it's not that, that, you know, you have to, this. it's just you say, if what I'm doing really matters that much, then I'm going to bring my best. Think of it like a... A, a, a sports player who's getting ready for a big game. What, what do they say to themselves? This one really matters. And so because it really matters, I better be ready. I better be on the ball. I better bring my best. And, and I'll tell you, if you believe that about the way you stack chairs or the way you handle bulletins or the way you greet people or make coffee or, or do children's ministry or whatever it is you do as part of the team, the way you just greet people on Sunday and, and, and worship and uh, so on, um, when you see that what you does matters, you treat it differently. And, and my dream is that every single person in our church would know how much it matters that, that, that you're part of the team 
and what you are as part of the team matters. So, uh, and, and what a great way to start these videos. We're going to do lots of them. Um, but as we orient you around being a part of Team Victory, and, and I got lots of things I want to share with you, but the first thing you need to know is uh, you matter so much. And, and so that's why we're doing these videos. Uh, and that's why I hope you'll feel motivated to watch these videos and really focus and, and gain something from them. Because what you're doing matters. It matters so, so, so uh, deeply and impacts lives. So again, thank you for what you do. It's a big deal. You matter. And I encourage you, uh, this is just video one, but I encourage you to watch your way through them uh, and, uh, and get a feel for what it is uh, being a part of Team Victory and how you can be the best part of Team Victory that you possibly can be. Thanks. God bless. All right. <laughs> wow. That is uh, really painful to watch yourself on video, just saying. <laughs> Whew. But um, I was talking to some people about this this week, and uh, somebody actually said to me while I was talking about this very topic, um, I probably wouldn't be, me and my family probably wouldn't be in this church today in all likelihood if it wasn't for a, a parking guy who did a fantastic job just park in our car on a Sunday morning when we were late for church. There it is, right? So, okay, so anyway, we're going to make more of those videos. I'll tell you more about that later. <laughs> if I can stand to watch them, we will make more. <laughs> I'm going to encourage you to watch them. Okay, so uh, what do we do? Maybe give you three things we can do. So the first thing we can do as a team, and again, this is all of us together, right? Because it's, it's a team that makes this church what it is. And really, again, at every level of growth of a church, um, this becomes increasingly true. So uh, that all the, 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 it's, it's the whole team that will help the church get to that next level. Okay, so set the table for guests. So uh, this summer, I went, uh, attended a church. It's a great church. Um, I think I'll talk about this on the next video, funny enough. But anyway, <laughs> as I... I already shot it, so I'm pretty sure I talk about this on the next video. But uh, <laughs> I went, I went to this church, and uh, it was a great church, great worship, great preaching, great people, great fellowship. Um, but I was an outsider, and I felt like an outsider. And uh, I, I went away just thinking, what was missing? Because everything was so good. And it's a good-sized church and good people, and they're they're not really uh, growing uh, in in reaching new people. And I. Just kept thinking over the next number of days, what was missing, what was missing, what was missing? And then it finally dawned on me, it was probably a week after, and it, the thought hit me, um, they're, they've built the whole system for themselves. It's an awesome system. Like, it'd be a great church to be a part of, because you'd grow, and you'd love people, and you'd meet people, and it'd be really nice, and the worship's good, and the preaching's good, so you'd just, it'd just be wonderful. You'd just be in that church, and it'd be so good. But what's missing is this, right? It's... It's this kind of church. It's just the table is set for themselves. And once you're in, you're in. And it'd be amazing. But it's real hard to get in. And you feel it. When you're a new person, you just feel like you're, you know, not quite sure if you're supposed to be there or not. Not that necessarily you're a bother, um, but just that you don't really exist until you're in. Did anybody ever felt like that going somewhere? <laughs> yeah, we all have, right? So, um, what, you know, how do we be the kind of place that, that does always make sure we have the table set for guests, right? You know, f your house is different when you set the table for guests. And by the way, setting the table for guests doesn't mean we don't feed ourselves, okay? We actually put plates at the table for ourselves too. So it's not like, oh, you set the table for guests, I guess the rest of the people don't matter. You know, it's just the new people that matter. No. When you set the table for guests, you have a, you have a different way of thinking about dinner, right? You have a different way of thinking about when somebody comes to the door. You know, you, you, if it's family, you just yell, you know, let yourself in, right? Or whatever, you know, can't you find your key? <laughs> right? Whatever. But when it's a guest, what do you do? You get up, you go to the door, you welcome them, you see if they need anything because they might not feel comfortable asking, right? And so you, you, you're, you're constantly thinking, you're aware not just of yourself and your needs, you're aware of them and their desires and their needs and so on. Uh, you know, Jesus told this parable of uh, the, the shepherd who left the 99 and went after the one. I, I think sometimes it takes that kind of disproportionate energy to make new people feel welcome. Okay? So, or, or to reach out to new people. When people are, are far, reaching those takes a disproportionate kind of energy. And it's not, again, it's not that the 99 don't need caring for. Super important we care for the 99. But it, it takes kind of a 99 to 1 
<laughs> disproportion of energy to reach that one. So, um, so, so anyway, we want to be able to do that as a church and build that as a culture. You know, if you've been attending here three weeks or more, then your job is to set the table for guests. Does that make sense? You know, once, once you've been here three times, you're, you're now part of the team, right? You're part of helping us make other people feel welcome. And that's part of building a culture where you're just like, oh, you're new? Great. Help me reach this other new person, right? So you build a culture um, that, that centers around that. And you say, well, well, how do we do that? Well, part of it is just a consciousness. It's just going, man, any new person, they matter so much. We know that on any given Sunday, somebody has come that, that someone's been praying for and probably invited 15 times and they're finally here, right? And so we know that person, man, that's a huge deal for them and we want the rest of us to feel that that's a huge deal. Uh, one of the fun rules that our church used to talk about a lot, that this is years and years ago, Pastor Larry would know this, what they called it the 10-foot rule. And that was if anybody comes within 10 feet of you, you smile and say hi. Anybody. A regular or, you know, most of us don't know whether a person's new or not, right? Because we don't know everybody. So just if somebody comes within 10 feet of you, smile and say hi. I think that's a great rule. Uh, Pastor Terry was talking, this is when Pastor Terry is pastor here, but uh, he's in uh, Regina Victory. And he was talking about now they, they've added another 10 rule. So they have the 10 foot rule and now they have the 10 minute rule. Get this one. This is pretty radical. For 10 minutes after the service, you're not allowed to talk to anyone who's a close friend. Oh, oh. So for 10 minutes, you got to look for newer people to talk to, you know, or somebody you don't know very well, right? Oh. <laughs> so painful. Anyway, I love it. Um, but you get the, the spirit of that. You get the mentality of that. It just, uh, it helps. And, and another thing that really sets the table for guests is you, you have a mentality that says, I don't want you just to show up and be, be here. Like, I, I know you're not supposed to be an inconvenience, but I want it to be more than that. When you come, I want to make sure I'm taking care of you. So let me give you an example. If you see somebody kind of wandering around looking like they don't know where they're going, just say to them, can I help you find anything? I'm taking care of you, right? If you had a guest in your home wandering around looking like they don't know where they're going, you'd do that, right? Okay, maybe that's an exaggeration, but you get the point. Um, or uh, uh, if, if somebody says to you, hey, um, where's the kids' ministry, right? Instead of saying, meh, down the stairs, you know, they're just over there. You say, they're downstairs, can I take you there? Do you know what a difference that makes to somebody? To just say, can I take you there? Walk them there? walk them down the stairs, walk them to the, the check-in counter and say, hey, this family was just asking where the kids' ministry was. Make the connection. Boom. You just wowed somebody, right? I was just reading this. Uh, one of my favorite, this is just from a book, a uh, business book. But anyway, one of my favorite mission statements from the Boca Rest, is from the Boca Restaurant Group, and it's called this, in quotes, blow people away, BPA. It gives everyone from chefs to managers to servers an actionable operating code by which to approach their work. There are many stories of servers going to extreme efforts to amaze and overwhelm customers. And every time one of these stories circulates, it becomes a testament to the company's mission, both internally and externally. It's also a frame for evaluating every customer interaction. Did I blow them away? <laughs> In every interaction, every meeting, every decision they make, employees are challenged with the, initial, uh, with the initialism BPA, it's their chosen battle line, what's yours? I thought, wow, that's so good. That's just so uh, what the, the, we hope the spirit around here is like. So, um, and I watched it this morning. I mean, I met probably six or eight new people this morning at church, and I watched family after family being cared for, being, you know, I, I actually, I, I knew there was a new family here that I was trying to catch up to at the end of the service, and by the time I got to them, there were three or four other people had already served them in various ways, right? Being like, just checking on them for this and help them with that. And I'm like, oh, I wanted to make sure you got, you know, this. And they're like, oh, yeah, somebody already showed us that. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I wanted to make sure you got that. Oh, yeah, somebody already did that. I'm like, this is awesome. And I'll tell you, that family, every step of the way, you could see it. They were, they were blown away. They really were. So anyway, that's part of how you build that culture. And again, that doesn't mean you have to be like some amazing person who knows everything and has everything figured out. It just means that everybody you see you just have that spirit of service towards them, right? How can I uh, be, a, be a blessing to you? Um, uh, let me just, one more thing on this. Um, and that is, um, 
when you have that spirit of setting the table for guests, and I, I mentioned it in the video, but you bring your best. Uh, one of the things we say around our staff team all the time is we call it Sunday is game day. Actually, you hear me say this at team day too, right? Sunday is game day. And what I mean by that is I actually purposely try to get a better sleep Saturday night because I'm like, oh man, tomorrow's game day. It's a big day, right? Literally like an athlete would for the next day. And then when I get up Sunday morning, I'm like, ooh, it's game day. It's game day, right? And then when I get here to church, I'm like, okay, it's game day. I better be on my best. I don't have a, my best day every Sunday, right? I, <laughs> you know that, right? Uh, but I want to come just, and then I, I want to do that all, all Sunday long. Why? Because all Sunday long, like Sunday morning, I'm meeting people. And, it, you know, this is my chance, right? To maybe have an impact on somebody's life and to maybe share God's love with them or, or encourage them or welcome them or whatever. So I'm just hoping, man, every conversation, every smile, every, you know, I, I, it's game day. And uh, we try to make uh, the most of that. So I just encourage if all of us could, could increasingly think that way about Sunday morning. So this isn't just, a, you know, the pastors have to make it game day. No, the, well, the whole team does. It helps us. Uh, and of course, when a, when a place builds a culture like that, doesn't it make the energy in the whole place change? Which, by the way, is one of the biggest ways you make a, a day game day. You bring energy. Um, when you think something's important, you bring energy to it. It's actually one of the main roles of leaders is to bring energy to something. So um, a buddy of mine is a, a trainer of managers, and he goes around does workshops, training workshops uh, for managers. And... Um, uh, we were chatting about this one time. He said, let me, let me bring you on one of our deals. And so we literally, we flew together to another city and uh, we get to this hotel and we're doing this training in this hotel room. And he says, oh, uh, it's like 15 minutes before the session starts. And he says, I just need some time on my own right now. I'm like, cool, what are you doing? He says, I'm getting some pumped up worship music on my iPod and I'm walking out that door back behind the hotel and I'm cranking up that music to get myself pumped for the next four hours of training. And I was like, cool. Then he brings his A game, right? Because he's, he's just, so for me, I have a little ritual where I go in my office and I get on my knees, I pray, pray a prayer before the service starts. It's part of my way of just going, God, help me bring my best. So anyway, we can all do that in our various, various ways. So that's the first thing is set the table for guests. Let's be that kind of church that just always has that outward spirit. And I think that's the heart of Christ. Um, to, to always, and you know, inward is natural, right? It's going to inevitably happen, so we just have to keep that outward peace. The second thing is care. Um, that is, uh, the, the, we, we care for the people around us. A church will only ever grow as large as it cares properly for people, okay? So this is just a reality. We can bring people in, and we do. I mean, this morning we had a ton of new people here. Um, I would say there was at least 30 or 40 uh, new people here this morning. So uh, either second, first, second, or third Sunday. So, you know, we get new people and you add that up over the course of a year. That's a lot of, a lot of humans, right? But how do people stay? Well, people will stay the initial couple times because they thought it was great or because, you know, God worked in their lives or those kind of things. And not everybody will, but some will. But three, four months, six months, one year, if by a year they don't feel care, they don't feel that relational care, people will drift away. Often not unintentionally, but you miss a few Sundays here, you, you go on holidays there, and things get busy there, you got sick, and if there's not that sense of care, it won't happen. So a church will only grow as large as the care that it, it uh, is able to offer. And so one of the questions I ask, if we're, if we're sitting around asking, you know, how do we grow by another 100 people? My question is, how do we care for another 100 people? Okay, so actually... Um, we're going to have these handed out. Do I have guys handing these out? All right, guys, thank you. So we actually just printed up this card. It's called a P's and Q's card. So some of you won't even know what P's and Q's are. If you're not old enough, you'd be like, what's a P's and Q's? What is that? But P's and Q's are like your manners. We say mind your P's and Q's, and that means mind your manners. Think think of your manners, okay? So you're like, mind your manners. What does that mean? But all right, so th these P's and Q's card is a little reminder of things to think about to care for people. And you can actually, uh, you know, keep this in your wallet or somewhere or just read it over once in a while. But this is just a way to think, how do I care for people? So uh, the first one on it just says, ask God to show me someone who needs care today. I actually learned this from my wife. A number of years ago, uh, Mariana is very introverted. 
has a hard time with crowds, like Pastor Barry was sharing last Sunday. And uh, she'd come to church on Sunday, and there's just person after person after person. It's like, oh. And one day she's struggling with this, and God spoke to her heart. Go to church every Sunday and ask God, who's the one person that I've called you to talk to today? And just when you have that in your mind, what's that one conversation that the Holy Spirit is inviting me to engage in today? Man, it makes such a difference. So ask God to show me someone who needs care today. Number two, have I met someone new today? Right? Number three, how can I add value to someone today? So, you know, when I meet people, I want to be a blessing to them. Number four, do I have any concerns about anyone that I should share with a leader today? So in other words, if you know somebody's going through uh, something in their marriage or they're going through something with their finances or with their health or those kind of things, and it's an appropriate thing to share with a leader, boy, it helps us a ton to know about those things. Uh, And good things, yeah, yeah, they have a baby, thank you, dear, or they got married, you know, stuff like that. Like, it's like, man, for us to find out about those things really helps us uh, uh, make sure that there's there's care going on, right? So a lot of times you guys are the, the people who help us know what's going on. And so to let Pastor Larry know or myself know or just uh, one of the pastors know, that, that helps. Um, number five, or your area leader, right? Number five, did I experience any feedback or complaints today? Again, passing those things on. I love it when I get feedback, um, especially if it's about a, a ministry. Somebody will say something to me about the worship ministry or about the kids' ministry, and I get to say to them, I'll pass that along to those who are a part of this, right? Because that'll help them either be encouraged or improve. So um, think about how you can pass those things along. A, a quick email or a, a message, messenger message uh, helps with that. But um, you might not realize just how much uh, this care piece you can do and, it, and how much it really matters. Um, as pastors, we feel absolutely overwhelmed as our church grows and as there's all these new people. And we're like, God, you've called us to care for these people, but we don't have the bandwidth um, to do it. And what gives us strength and comfort in the midst of that is that we don't have to do it alone. That we're a team of hundreds of people that are all ministers of the gospel, that all have the same Holy Spirit, and that all can care one for another. That the one another's of the Bible are not meant for pastors, they're meant for believers, right? So if you're a Christian here, you can do the one another's. And, and, um, our daughter serves in the nursery uh, every Sunday. She serves in nursery. And at, on Sunday afternoon, we grill her about all the people in the nursery. <laughs> so if you have kids in nursery, we hear about you. Uh, it's so funny because we're like, so tell me about the kids in there today. And then she starts listing them off. And we're like, who's that? Who's their parents? What, you know, what's, what's their, and, and she'll, because we don't know. Like we literally don't know these people and we're their pastor, Right. So just that chance, I mean, that half hour on Sunday afternoon is like gold to us because we're like, whoa, how do, you know, so you, you're the front line of pastoral care in our church and you do the vast majority of pastoral care in our church. Um, I love it. I I hear about somebody who had a baby and I'm like, oh, I I wonder if we should maybe get them a meal and then I'll check on it and I'll find out there's like six families lined up to bring meals. I'm like, well, who planned that? Oh, I don't know. Ask so-and-so. Well, who planned? Well, I don't know. Ask so-and-so. Pretty soon I get, you know, fourth generation down and I find out somebody in our church planned it. It's great. That's exactly how the church should operate, right? So it's just us doing these one anothering. So anyway, if we can care for a hundred more, we can grow by a hundred more. So uh, care and then um, develop our, your leadership. So um, a couple months ago, I was at a conference training and a guy named Pastor Rich Conte was there. He's from our, uh, he leads our churches in the Philippines. And he had planted seven or eight churches, um, grown them up to around 100, 150 people. And he had told his wife, I'm burned out. Um, I don't think I'll be able to, I don't think I have another church plant in me. And then he met um, our leaders in Thailand uh, and then eventually met our leaders here in Canada, Dr. George and Hazel Hill. And uh, he asked them, you know, how do you guys do what you do? And Pastor George says, well, we we try to plant churches, but with strength. And here's how we do it. And it just gave him a whole new vision. He went in and he planted a church on their first Sunday. They had over 400 people on their very first Sunday. And um, since then, that church has grown over to over 2,500 people. And they've planted other churches of over uh, a couple of a thousand and so on. And just God's done some really, really cool things in the Philippines um, since he had sort of a new vision. So I'm listening to this guy do training a few weeks ago in Calgary, and he says, you know, we had plateaued as a church around 700. 
And we, you know, at each plateau, we knew there was a different thing that we had to add to our culture, and he named those. And I was like, oh, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that. And then he said, but you know what? At this level, I kept asking different leaders, and they kept telling me, you need to develop leadership in your church. You need to do leadership development. And he said, I just kept putting it off because I just was like, ah, I don't really want to make that, you know, that's a lot of work, and I'm not sure how, and, and all of this. And finally, one day, he caved and started doing leadership development, and he said that was the breakthrough for that thing. Well, when he said that in the pre-conference training that I was at a few weeks ago, something in my heart just went, yep, I know I've been avoiding that. And I know that's a challenge, and I just feel exactly how he described it. I was like, oh, I just, I want to do more leadership development, but I find it hard, and I don't know what track to run on, and all these things. And uh, that's what birthed these videos. So we're going to be running these videos, and my, my hope and prayer, and I'm saying this as a faith commitment to you, because I've shot only two of them, but I'm going to shoot like lots. <laughs> I'm scared to give you a number. Over 20, Okay. Over 20 of them, and they're five minutes long or shorter, and there might be some that, that I do longer that are, are deeper level ones, but we'll try to keep them all five minutes long or shorter. But here's the deal. I want you to watch them. I've already got like I think 30 or 40 ideas for videos that I'm like, oh, if I could train our, our people in this in leadership, if I could train us in that in leadership, if I could train in that in leadership, five minute chunks, and uh, I, I just think it'd be a, a valuable thing. So. Uh, it sounds cliche, and I've actually avoided saying it too much over the last 11 years, but um, all of us are leaders, right? So I try to just say team members around here because I think this leadership thing gets a little overplayed sometimes. Um, but uh, we are leaders, and we need to step up and lead. And so last Sunday, I'm in Sunday school, and the lesson is about Deborah. So I'm just sitting there listening to this awesome lesson that Raleen was teaching about Deborah. And Deborah is this lady in the Old Testament. She's one of the judges. And uh, she steps up and leads when this guy won't lead, right? Which is such a cool story because it's like the lady's going to lead because the guys won't, you know. And Anyway, it's, it's, it's a cool story. And I'm listening to this, and the message of the lesson is leaders go first. In other words, if you see something that needs to be done, step up. And, and here's the deal. I don't know if you've ever been in a room where there's a whole group of people and there's really obvious things that should be different and nobody does anything. You ever been in a space like that? And you're just like, will somebody somewhere just kind of go, um, could we change this because it's not working at all? Everybody would breathe a sigh of relief, right? Is that true? So, <laughs> somebody thinks this is funny in the back there. Okay, so uh, that, that's what leaders do. And if we could all do that, you know, if you see something that can be different or better, figure out a way to help make it better. Does that make sense? So we, if we all do that, that's just stepping up. The reason we don't is because we're afraid of rejection or we're afraid we might be wrong or, you know, so we think, oh, somebody else will. And then so many times nobody does. And it's like, oh, you know, is there a leader in the house? <laughs> Step up. And, of course, that's for all of us. So those are the three things that I would love uh, all of us to do and uh, that I wanted to share with you and that I felt really just in prayer, wow, let's gather our team and, and invite us all to live that out. And, and you are Victory Church. You are Team Victory and, and just thank you for, for being that. So I want to just, because of these meetings, it's good for you to know what's going on. I want to tell you a few of the things that are, are happening here. So we're going to have this Team Victory orientation and training videos. I already told you about that and I'll be setting up a YouTube channel for that. Um, so watch over the next probably three weeks for that to get officially launched. We have kickoff Sunday happening September the 8th, which is real soon. And so we'll have a ministry fair in the lobby. If you're a leader of a ministry, touch base with Pastor Barry um, and just uh, talk about what, uh, you know, if you have any cool ideas for your ministry table or things, you can talk to him about that and so on. Um, we also have, look at this, 25th anniversary of our church. Isn't that crazy? That's this year. Yeah. It's pretty fun. So um, we're going to celebrate that on September 29th, and Dr. George and Hazel Hill are going to come for that. So they're going to be here. Um, we will uh, very likely have our mayor here and other dignitaries and stuff too to just celebrate a 25th anniversary together. So that'll be our morning service. Then in the evening, we're going to have kind of like a, a big family celebration, a service as well. And Pastor Terry and Terry Murphy, who are the former pastors here, are going to come to that, as well as Pastor Brad and Wendy Dewar, the ones who founded the church. Yeah, way back in the day. So 
super fun to have them coming. And um, God willing, I haven't confirmed with them yet, but uh, I'm working with uh, Pastor David and Tara Yamba as well because they were pastors in our church and then we planted our a church in Regina from this church uh, to them. So anyway, we'd like him to come and say a few words too. But uh, we're going to be doing that Sunday morning, Sunday evening on the 29th. And uh, we want you to, to know about it first and we'll be getting the news out uh, more about that and, and uh, trying to make that Sunday really special. Um, Alpha is starting uh, really soon, September 16th. So that, that's just one of those uh, events that takes a lot of energy to, to get rolling. So if you'd like to attend or you know somebody who'd like to attend, help us promote that. Women's Night, uh, we have, I think we call it, I don't know, Women's Night Out or Ladies' Night Out. So that's happening September 27th, just before the 25th anniversary on a Friday night. And Pearl, I think I saw Pearl. Pearl, do you want to just stand and wave at us? This is Pearl Dresser, everybody. Hey, Pearl. So you might remember Pearl led worship a few Sundays ago. You remember that? Wasn't that awesome? Yeah, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so Pearl is our new women's ministry leader. Um, she's taken that. Sherry Jakes was our women's ministry leader, and then she moved to Rwanda. Right? So, um, so uh, Pearl's taking that, and we're praying you don't move to Rwanda too, all right? We can keep you here. And so is, is Pastor Jeff. Who's, uh, so that, you know, Pastor Jeff, our worship pastor, that's his wife, right? It's Pearl. And so um, that's happening September 27th, ladies. Um, and then you can see lots of other things that are normal September things, but they're all starting back up. We have our Celebrate Recovery Banquet on the 10th, Couples Cafe on the 14th, Mom's Connection starts up. The 23rd, Young Adults is a new ministry happening on Wednesdays, and there's a bunch more, and I, I won't dig into all of them, but uh, those are there uh, for you to know about. And here's the deal again. This isn't just so you're like, oh, I, I know that's happening now. Yay, if I want to go, I can. But it's great for you to be aware of these things because you're a connector, right? You might know somebody who might be interested in that, or you meet somebody in, in the foyer or somewhere or sitting in, in near you and you're chatting with me, you're like, hey, would you be interested in this or that? Just this morning I met uh, a couple people who were new in our church and uh, one of them was 19 years old and the other one was 15 years old. And so I was like, hey, we have young adults and youth. You should meet them. And I pointed over at him and as soon as I pointed at, at Jeremy, um, he comes running over to meet them, right? And so then I'm like, here, here, here he is, you know, me, and so on. So that's, there he is, there's Jeremy, yeah. Hey, Jeremy, we love you. All right. So you can help make those, those connections if you know what's, what's happening. Um, yeah. So here's how I would like us to end the evening. We started in prayer. Here's the deal, church. Uh, for us as a church, prayer is the, the fountain foundation of all that we do. We know that we're in the impossible business. We know this is God's deal. And uh, we need God big time. 